Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Trisha Rose, and I'm a professor of Africana Studies and the director of the Center for the Study of Race and Ethnicity in America, the CSREA, here at Brown University. Thank you so much for joining us in the seventh session of the Race and in America series. Today's topic is race and genetics in America. Working in collaboration with Provost Richard Locke, CSREA launched this eight part series to inspire ongoing informed discussion on race and race on and beyond the Brown community. I've said it before and it bears repeating. We simply don't talk in a consistent or adequately informed manner about race and racism. And too often attention is crisis provoked, generating much more heat than light. This Race and in America series brings together impressive scholars at Brown who work on race across various disciplines and who have consistently generated reflective light on complex issues. All of the sessions have been excellent and I know that today's will not disappoint. A quick reminder, our next and final session for this academic year is set for April 21st at noon and it's on race and anti-Black racism. I'd like to thank today's panelists for taking time to share their expertise and for inviting us all to think more critically and creatively. Special thanks to my colleague, Dr. Phyllis Dennery for agreeing to moderate this session. Dr. Dennery is the Sylvia K. Hassenfeld Professor and Chair of Pediatrics at the Warren Alpert Medical School. She's also Pediatrician in Chief at Rhode Island Hospital, Medical Director at Hasbro Children's Hospital, and Professor of Molecular Biology, Cell Biology, and Biochemistry here at Brown. Her clinical interests are the long-term consequences of prematurity as well as perinatal health disparities. She's been published in top-tier journals on oxidative stress, mediated neonatal lung gene regulation, and on hyperoxic lung injury and repair. You can read more about Dr. Dennery's work in her biography that will be linked in the chat. Phyllis, thank you for joining us. And now I'll invite you to say a word about the format and introduce the panelists. Thank you. Thank you so much, Professor Rose. And many thanks to all of you who are joining us today for this very thought provoking and exciting uh, seminar. I'm really pleased to be part of this series and in particular this session on the often misinterpreted, misconstrued and fraught topic of race and genetics. Today's presentations and discussions are designed to gain a deeper understanding about what contemporary science and research can tell us about the subject. As Professor Rose noted, I am a physician, so I also have training in genetics and in my own views have been shaped by so many aspects of just reflecting on the concept of how do we assign a single genetic phenotype to a population that has undergone so much admixture through the diaspora and many other events. So it is boiling something down to a very simplistic concept when in fact it's very complex. I prefer to have the panelists spend the time that they need to spend to talk to you about their unique perspectives. And what we'll have today as a format is three panelists. Each will speak for approximately 10 minutes for their particular and distinct scholarly perspective. Each one is so unique. Following their remarks, uh, we'll engage in a Q&A we have some questions that have come up through the uh, chat and the Q&A, uh, and uh, I'll have some questions as well for the audience. But we'll provide ample time for audience questions, and some of which, as I said, have come in advance. Please use the Q&A function at the bottom of the screen to submit your questions. There are a lot of attendees, so right now we're at 256 participants. So we will try to get to as many questions as possible. And uh, we are really extremely fortunate to have the wonderful panelists that we have here. And I thank all of the individuals who are helping us on this journey, uh, including our interpreters, uh, ASL interpreters, um, and other captioners, 
and of course, uh, Dr. Rose for her, um, her leadership here. Um, so our first speaker will be Dr. Sohini Ramachandran. Dr. Ramachandran is an Associate Professor of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and an Associate Professor of Computer Sciences. She's also, she is currently the Director of the Center for Computational Molecular Biology and the Interim Director of the Data Science Initiative. We've been fortunate to have her at Brown since 2010 as a faculty member. Her research addresses problems in population genetics and evolutionary theory using humans as a study system and employing mathematical modeling, applied statistics and computer simulations to make inferences from genetic data. Sohini, please. Thank you so much. Um, thank you, Phyllis, for the introduction. And it is my great privilege to be a part of this wonderful series and to be speaking with my colleagues and friends, Dr. Brandon Ogbenu and Dr. Lauren Crawford. Um, I just wanna say that in this last 11 years now that I've been on the faculty at Brown, I have been so lucky to um, learn from colleagues both in my own discipline, such as the colleagues I'll be speaking with today, as well as across disciplines. And so I'm excited for this conversation and for future conversations um, and grateful to those of you who are in the audience for taking time to be with us today. Um, so I am a population geneticist and I'm gonna define how in my field, we view the word population in a little bit. Um, so hold, stay tuned for that. Um, but what I focus on, as um, Dr. Danneray just mentioned, is the genomic signatures of deep historical processes in our own species genomes. So I'm interested in how the emergence of the human species in Africa has left signatures on our genomes, how our ancestors' migrations both at large scales across a range of ecosystems across the world and at smaller scales in more recent times have affected our genomes um, in population growth and also in the genetic signatures of more recent contact during especially imperialism and due to chattel slavery on our genomes. So I think of the genome as a historical text that can teach us just as other historical lines of evidence can about local and global processes in the deep past. Um, I think many people come to the field of evolutionary biology because of a fascination with the origin of species, whether that's through Darwin's own incredibly compelling writing um, or through a fascination with natural history and observing the diversity of life around us. But my what drew me to this field and my kind of polemic in my field is that historical processes have played a great role in the generation of human genetic diversity today and much more so than has natural selection. So I just wanna be clear that that's sort of the stance that I take when I, um, when I study human genetic variation. So today what I wanted to start um, this conversation with is by talking about contemporary issues in the discussion of race and genetics from the point of view of a practicing geneticist. And I wanted to talk about issues that I think, you know, after 20 years since I started graduate school and since the draft sequence of the human genome has been published, um, conversations that we're still struggling with in genetics specifically. Um, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is nomenclature because I think there is a huge challenge for geneticists to explain in our own technical writing and especially to those who are trying to consume the results of that technical writing, the difference between a population, ancestry, and race. And so I'll give you my, my view as a practitioner of how I view these terms and I know my co-panelists will also um, respond if they wanna uh, edit or provide their own viewpoint on these three terms. So first, what is a population? The population in both statistics, which as Dr. Denry mentioned, is a, a key field to my work, um, and in biology has a technical definition that also requires kind of poking at. Um, so 
in statistics, what we try to do is to learn about properties of a population from a sample. And that's the process of statistics is to sample a population um, in order to make inference about, about or sam take a sample in order to make inference about a population. In biology, the definition is slightly different and couldn't be nuanced, but the most basic definition of a population is that it's a group of individuals of the same species. Many people would also consider a population to be randomly mixing. So if that group of individuals of the same species are subdivided geographically, we might call all of those different groups populations. So there's often a geographic element to the definition, but also um, a, an element of it is random mixing of genetic material within the population. So what this means is often in genetic studies, we might simulate or describe our samples based on geography, which is part of the problem when we talk about race and genetics. If I talk about the European population, which is a common term that might be used in a study, what does that actually mean? Does that mean people who are living in Europe today who can come from a range of different genetic ancestries? Does it mean people who were living in Europe 10,000 years ago? How do the people living in Europe today relate to those people living in Europe 10,000 years ago? So that's one sort of challenge. I think a word that in the last decade we try to use more in our studies is ancestry, with the idea that we can infer ancestry. But I think this also creates other problems because especially as we study genomes of individuals of mixed ancestry, in order to describe an individual's ancestry, there's still a process by which we discretize the sources of their ancestry. Um, I have two daughters, they are of mixed race, so I might describe them as having both South Asian and Northern European ancestry. But again, that still creates this problem of needing references with which to understand their genetic ancestry. And um, it also means that we might talk about mixed ancestry as a, again, a population level process instead of a process that can produce a spectrum of different genomes that draw on ancestries in quite flexible ways. So lastly, race, I would say in terms of genetics literature is sort of, um, everything that I didn't talk about when I talked about a population or ancestry. So often I think um, population geneticists would say that race when used in a population genetic study is a catch-all term for self-identified categories, which may or may not actually have been identified by the subjects of the study. Um, these might have been checkboxes on a medical intake form that um, led to a study. These might have very limited categories. They might have, in fact, been um, done through a survey via a translator in an anthropological study um, and, and be quite limited. So again, there's this kind of sort of discretization of um, possible categories that I think creates some problems. Um, and I'd love to talk more about the issues of nomenclature today. So other reasons why I think the conversation about genetics and race is still a struggle for practitioners in the field is um, also that despite what we might think from reading the newspaper or the rhetoric around the era of personalized medicine always being just around the corner where our genome is just going to be a really integrative part of our healthcare and be used in order to give us better healthcare and a better quality of life, it is still incredibly difficult to predict a health outcome from a genome. For most of the health outcomes that we care about, especially that lead to a long, um, good quality of life in our late adulthood. But with enough data, we can predict ancestry very well under what I would call a supervised classification framework, where we again have reference data and we sort of decide to agree that we know the ancestry of those references. Many of you might have experienced this if you've done a direct to consumer genetic test with a company like 23andMe or with Ancestry DNA, um, where you learn a little bit about your ancestry. And that's something that again, because of the sort of interest people have in ancestry, we can predict quite well. And I think this ability to predict ancestry well leads us to think that there are other predictions that are more meaningful biologically and especially with respect to health 
that we can make across ancestries. And um, I think much of our conversation today will be about the fact that this is actually quite difficult to do for lots of great reasons. The last thing that I'll say that I'd love to touch on is what worries me a lot as a population geneticist right now is where engagement online is coming from with respect to the latest population genetics and medical genetics studies. So when I was in graduate school, um, the internet did exist, and but a lot of the online engagement with my work um, is was coming from evangelical or creationist groups who were very interested in evidence for the origin of humans in one place and sort of wanting to take evidence of the African origin of humans and turn that into evidence of our origin in a place that may have been the Garden of Eden. So now I'll tell you that, um, especially I think there have been a lot of studies about this in social media, but one interesting one that'll get chatted out is by Jed Carlson and Kelly Harris in my field who are at University of Washington. Now the bulk of online engagement with medical genetic studies and population genetic studies is coming from white supremacist groups. These are individuals who think that they are special because they are, for example, lactose tolerant. You may have seen that there are some groups who will chug gallons of milk in order to demonstrate their whiteness and this special adaptation that they have. Um, and the funding of genetic studies being concentrated in the West gives a lot of oxygen to these kinds of views. Um, despite the fact that, for example, lactose intolerance post weaning is the ancestral state for all mammals and it's the dominant phenotype, um, by which I mean in number, it's not genetically dominant, um, for humans throughout the world. Um, so I think that this fascination with certain aspects of medical literature and the way that it's highlighting our differences and genetic literature and the way that it's highlighting our differences is really problematic. And it's one that geneticists are trying to push against, but are also, I think, feeling very, um, it's really challenging, right? Does one wanna give more oxygen to this discussion or not? And I'll just say one area that I think is fueling this fire of white nationalism is um, the, preoccupation with the interaction between modern humans or homo sapiens and Neanderthals that has happened at different points in our history, particularly in Europe, even though we know that all these hominin species were together in Africa for a long time before the human diaspora out of Africa. So many companies will tell you how much Neanderthal DNA you have. This amount is at most about 5% and that's in individuals of European ancestry again. And there's amazing research on some very interesting adaptive mutations that entered human genomes through this interaction with archaic hominins. In fact, one textbook example was discovered by our colleague at Brown, Amelia Huerta Sanchez. But I think that the amount of interest there is in the press and in scientific journals around this work compared to say work on disparate health outcomes amongst today's communities in the US and differential access to healthcare and how that might intersect with genetic risk um, is, is something that we should really as a field try to overcome. And so I hope that discussions like this will help us to identify as a field what we should value and how to make sure our work has the greatest impact that it can. Thank you very much for those very thoughtful comments. Uh, next, we'll hear from C. Brandon Ogbonu, an assistant professor in the Department of Ecology in evolutionary biology at Yale University. Prior to this, he was on the faculty at Brown. So we're really pleased to have him back today. He's a computational biologist who re whose research investigates complex problems in epidemiology, population genetics, and evolution. Professor Igbonu. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, it is incredibly special to be here for many, many reasons with all of these individuals that I admire. Uh, Dr. Rose, thank you for uh, kind of curating this extended series of events. Really the best place, you know, arguably in the world to have these types of conversations and I'm privileged to be a part of it. Thank uh, everyone who contributed to putting this together. Um, what excites me about this conversation uh, is the opportunity to have it right with not only two close friends of mine, 
but people, and I'm bookended by two individuals who are towering figures in the technical side of these questions. And I, I've been kind of involved in this conversation in various fronts and various ways got through the years. Um, but I've never kind of had been able to kind of have this type of technical conversation. So it's an extreme privilege to be able to have this. And I think this has been a missing, missing dimension because a lot of the confusion about race and genetics really is about kind of technical things that we don't understand sometimes ourselves as scientists or we kind of debate and uh, but certainly the public doesn't understand or there are individuals in the public like professor ramachandran identified who kind of actively bend the truth right so this is kind of an opportunity to be able to kind of have a bigger conversation here um following you know professor ramachandran's elucidatory comments on kind of various terms and various conflicts what i'll do is i'll deposit some thoughts as someone whose research and scholarship takes place along two kind of related uh, dimensions. One is the role of the environment in crafting how genes kind of behave, right? Is a kind of, a, right? The, the other one is the interaction between science and sociocultural phenomena. Now, I'm not, right, I'm no Professor Rose, I'm not trained in these kind of uh, sociological and historical fields. But I think this interest has emerged from my study, right, of kind of gene by environment interactions. And I've found that there are few application spaces for these interests that are purer than the race and genetics discussion. Now, to start this conversation, perhaps surprisingly, what I'll do is I'll stick up for genetics. I'll say some nice things about the field, right? And why is this necessary? Because even I'm guilty of being so cynical of the science as a whole, that conversations about the role they play in race and genetics conversations, right, can, can become ultra negative and it can become pylons. And I can, I've, I've even found myself in that. So allow me then to state unequivocally that I think DNA is among the most fascinating, interesting pieces of information in the universe. I mean, it encodes a staggering and important amount of information and instructions for building and operating organisms. From its study, we can learn incredible things, right, and information about how our organism works, about evolutionary relationships, about the origin of species, and Professor Ramachandran identified some of this. And much more provocatively, but no less true, we do learn meaningful things about what makes organisms and individuals different, right? The reasons there are domesticated animals and plants is because the science of genetics is true and works, right? The reason I can joke that I had to give up my dream of being an NFL running back might be because I'm very slow. And part of the reason I'm so slow is because of things that I inherited from my biological parents. So those things can be true. The problem becomes when you, right, when you take those truisms Right. And you fail to identify the giant gap between the good things and the truths that genetics offers, which are many. Right. And the notion that we can use differences in DNA to explain the vast diversity and complexity and capriciousness of human experience. Or that DNA is the only dimension that meaningful, ca meaningfully captures differences in human beings. Right. All right. That they can explain the profoundly large differences in that we kind of attribute to race, ethnicity and gender. This is where the problem resides. It's in the fairly it's in the toxic idea, frankly, that starts naively, but it becomes toxic that DNA information can be explained to can be used to explain history and rationalize historical trajectories of different individuals on earth. So what I'll attempt to do in the next few minutes, right, is, right, that would be set the table, set the table there. Uh, I'll attempt to kind of define what the problem really is. And some of this will kind of involve invoking some of the concepts that uh, Dr. Ramachandran identified. We'll talk about how we got here, and then we'll kind of talk about what are the kind of ethical and conceptual issues that, we'll, that we need to resolve to move forward. So, uh, we talked about what populations are, and we talked about kind of what is a race and why is a race not a helpful term biologically in, when, when we're thinking about uh, when we're thinking about kind of genetic information. Now, it is a it a race as we've identified it can be a marker 
powerfully marker for social experience. And insofar as it encodes a social or historical experience, that can have biological and biomedical significance, which is why we need to consider it as a thing. The problem is the essentialization and the hardening of the barriers around racial groups. That is where the problem comes in. That's not, right? I think the genetic science does not support that notion of essential difference at the level of races. But the notion that this is useful to understand in particular, as we think about biomedical problems, and we're seeing this play out in COVID-19, when you look at the indigenous, right, uh, infection and death rate being so staggeringly high, right, we don't know what the full answer to that question is, but it is a very fair and reasonably safe hypothesis that you can connect that to their historical trajectory in this country, and that has kind of health implications, right? The other kind of conceptual thing uh, is the notion that there are genes for certain phenotypes, right? There are traits. We see this in journalism all the time. This is one that is wrong. And again, you know, I hope I have not been complicit there, but certainly the field has, right? There are no genes for traits, right? There are genes that encode, right? That, that, that can carry the information that encode and contribute to phenotypes. But right, the one-on-one -on -one relationship between genetic information and traits is a kind of, it's, it's a misunderstanding and one that needs to be corrected, right? Professor Ramachandran also mentioned the difficulty in being able to cleanly predict phenotype from genotype. This is a technical challenge and we are trying to do it better and better, but we are continuously finding that it is very, very challenging. You have studies like in, you know, uh, in Northern Europe where, which is presumably homogenous, right? Uh, genetically, you have, you have studies whereby you move across the country and kind of genetic risk scores that we use to predict certain phenotypes change just by geography across a country that is otherwise supposed to be homogenous. So what I'm saying is there, there are a lot of kind of confounders there. Now, how did we arrive at this point where we have all of this misunderstanding and we have all of these problems? Well, again, everything is embedded in the history, right? This field that we study did not emerge from the ether, right? Um, I think we can go back to, I think most of us are familiar with Gregor Mendel and the monk in the garden and what that's about. And um, the idea there is that Gregor Mendel kind of was able to, uh, you know, was able to discover these really, really important set of principles about how, how kind of inheritance works. I don't know if it was beginner's luck, right, that he kind of identified this, right, this, the system, the pea plant, where he was able to extract these laws out. But since then, we kind of try to treat everything like it's a pea plant, and that's not how most life works. And so in some ways, kind of, we're kind of limited by that. But more than that, right, the study in particular of human genetics is colored very, no pun intended, uh, very, very, um, very firmly by trying to understand differences between people. And I think racism kind of factored into that very early. I think there's a whole history about eugenics we can discuss. So the idea here is the study of human genetics is a continuation. Those things are continuous from the study of race and racism, right? Those things are kind of, right, are in, and, and rationales for why certain populations have certain life outcomes. So my point is we are limited in some ways, right, by the ontogeny of the field that we study. So it needs deep reflection. The last thing I'll mention, and I think it's important to reflect on. So what we've done is we've kind of talked about kind of some terminology issues, right? That kind of, what are the problems exactly? And is that we don't really understand a lot of these terms. We talked about population that has multiple definitions. We've talked about race that has multiple definitions uh, and people use them interchangeably. We talked about having a gene for certain things. That's a broken idea, right? That we get wrong. And I think this kind of ends up uh, snowballing into the kind of modern uh, problem that we see. We talked about the historical trajectory that got us here, all the way going from Gregor Mendel, right? We've had, a, a genetics has done this really beautiful job of articulating these patterns of inheritance. And that is not how most traits that we care about uh, in Homo sapiens work. Even things like sickle cell anemia, for example, that are Mendelian, right? as in they do reflect patterns, uh, kind of as described by Gregor Mendel, even those have changed 
with time, right, as people have lived different ways and as environments have changed, right, even that now the relationship between genotype and phenotype isn't quite as neat as we thought, right. But in light of this, we need to kind of define what the modern problem is, and we need to be honest about what we're curious about, what the ethical issues are, right. When we're asking about group racial differences, right, really what people are asking for, and Professor Ramachandran made a reference to this with regards to white supremacists, people want a smoking gun that explains something about the world today. It might be about how to better educate children in a classroom, right? But it's mostly about why it might be, and, and, and for a lot of people, I can't speak for everyone, but it really does mostly is about why it's okay to lock up black and brown people at certain rates or why girls aren't, at good at, aren't as good at math, right? And this is where we're running into trouble because if you wanna use DNA to understand patterns and to understand the underlying biology and as an information space to think about the way an organism is constructed, think about the kind of relationships between things and information that may underline diabetes risk or something of that nature, I think that's great. But if you wanna understand the way the world shook out or why there aren't women, more women in, in math departments or why, uh, why, why the incarceration rates look the way they do in the United States, right? Do your homework because genetics is not going to help you there the way you think it does. Certainly in the case of incarceration, there's a very clear signature of history, right? That we can use to explain that, right? And so the way I reflect on this, what's the solution and how can we think about these things more firmly? I think I'll close with what I like to think about with regards to genetic problems. Let's look at our own lives, right? Let's look at our own lives. Take my mother, for example, okay? Now, uh, she, she, she kind of was a school teacher, which is about as far as women went in that generation and black women went in that generation. If you look at the differences between my life trajectory and hers, okay? Anybody that invokes genetics right, has a lot of explaining to do. My mother experienced the, the, la the end of Jim Crow, right? She grew up in Baltimore, right? And she's several generations removed from slavery. So what I'm saying is if in one generation, you see the signature for how the world and how history and how structure and society can craft two completely different realities, right? For people who are phenotypically very similar. And so what I'm saying is if we can see that signature that has nothing to do with genetics between me and my mother, Right. The truth, the same is true on Earth today. Right. The same is almost uncertainly is, so, is certainly true today. And so we can look within our own lives. We can look into the way kind of uh, the way lives are shaped, like shape trajectories, social trajectories, and use that as a cue uh, for why it is we need to enrich our genetic picture of the world with more diverse and multifaceted perspectives. Thank you. Thank you so much for these really thought-provoking comments. Finally, we'll hear from Lauren Crawford, the RGSS Assistant Professor of Biostatistics at Brown with an affiliation in the Center for Computational Molecular Biology. He's also a senior researcher at Microsoft Research New England. He's, his scientific interests involve the developing of a compu computational methods to address problems in statistical genetics, cancer pharmacology, and clinical imaging. Florin. Thanks, thanks so much for having me. And I just wanna uh, give a round of applause to this, uh, Dr. Ramachandran and uh, Professor Abunu for uh, those amazing remarks. Um, for those who don't know me, I'm a, a trained statistician. So I'm not coming at this from a, a trained biology or genetics perspective. Um, but my, my, my thoughts here and where I'm coming from is, you know, I think about uh, my research program is really focused on this idea of dissecting gener uh, phenotypic variation across individuals. And so you can think about phenotypes, everything that we've been talking about, traits as being like an entire pie, right? And I, and I focus on building methods that uh, really focus on describing how, you know, whether it's gene A plus gene B's effect that's giving rise to a trait, uh, gene A times gene B that's giving rise to a trait, uh, maybe the genes in, a, in, in response to some environmental or social factors giving rise to a trait, and how that architecture and that breakdown over that pie 
dissection might change if you look at different groups of individuals or, or different people in different settings. Um, so, so here, as part of this conversation, you know, I really think about statistics, methodology, uh, you know, machine learning, data science, it's kind of being this bridge that really uh, closes the gap or, or connects the, the conceptual frameworks that things that Dr. Ramachandran and, and, and uh, Professor Vuna were talking about uh, with, you know, these testable hypotheses that we use to fully understand genetics, um, uh, characterized biology, and, and push towards this goal, I think that Dr. Ramachandran was mentioning, this idea of, of personalized medicine uh, for, for people. And so, in a short amount of time, I really just want to focus on uh, this idea of what we can think about to maybe solve some of these conceptual issues um, and think about how to chip away some of these problems, you know, uh, uh, with methods. And so a big topic of what we talked about today, and I, I mentioned I saw a lot of questions about this in, in, in the chat and the Q&A, of thinking about language and, and how we define groups. And so in, in terms of statistical methodology right now, you know, a lot of people uh, are thinking about how to understand the differences and similarities across individuals. And what I've realized in, in my uh, viewpoint of working on these methods is that we don't really have standardized language to, to deal with this. And so there are a few ways to kind of think about this. Um, you know, uh, I think uh, Sahini had mentioned this a little bit, you know, right now a lot of studies focus on um, this idea of like self-reported ancestry or self-identified uh, 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 racial descriptions. And so she, she mentioned that this thing is kind of discretized and, and that kind of creates a little bit of an issue um, in, in terms of uh, uh, methods, right? Because you can think about when we when we uh, are trying to identify um, instances across individuals, um, there's a little bit of us kind of studying this G by E interactions that Brandon's really interested in, um, where ancestry is kind of this idea of part genetics now and, and a little bit of part our environmental uh, or social identification of ourselves, right? And so there's a question where we're building methods, you know, how do we think about um, uh, how social interactions might play a role on these uh, on these gene effects and this G by E experience, and even more complex questions, you know, is you know social determinants are temporal and they could be spatial, like Brandon was mentioning. And so, how do we kind of reconcile this idea of G by E environmental effects or this idea of broad sense heritability of traits, maybe always kind of changing depending on uh, uh, th this environmental or social movement uh, um, uh, through our daily lives. Um, and so that kind of gets me to this uh, really important question I've been thinking a, a lot about. You know, when we build methods to think about how to draw associations between our genetics um, uh, and, and uh, our phenotypes and how that might differ across different groups of people um, and, and how we define those different groups, whether it be spatially or, or based on ancestral lineage, um, you know, we really need to think about how we evaluate these methods, right? And so there's an entire literature in computer science and, and machine learning, I think about algorithmic bias. And, and there's a little bit of that that you can think about taking that angle here when we when we build statistical genetic methods to, to understand phenotypic architecture, predicting polygenic risk for individuals, and how to maybe delineate that bias. Um, and so here, you know, in, in, terms of, in terms of phenotypic prediction, we have good measurements for this, right? These ideas of like root mean squared error, how close am I to predict a certain trait for a given individual when I know the truth? For association mapping methods, this idea of understanding how gene A encodes a trait for a given individual or how gene B encodes a trait for an individual and how that might be differ across individuals, we don't necessarily have a good uh, uh, metric for that. And so one thing that's kind of bothered me in our space as far as I think that we're trying to improve on is the idea that, this is, that we're expecting biology to replicate across people. And there's a, there's, a, there's a sweet notion here that we're all human beings. And so the same uh, things that affect the phenotype in one individual should affect the phenotype in another individual. Um, but that that's the stringency of that replication gets a little dicey, I think, on the mutation level, this idea of uh, mutations in, in a group A should replicate in mutations of group B. Um, and so when you move, uh, you know, there's been a call, at least for myself, Professor Ramachandran, uh, Brandon, think about things at higher scales, right? Yes, we all are humans. And so you can think about certain biological mechanisms mattering. So not necessarily p-values replicating across studies, but this biological mechanism replicates for this, for this individual and as, as well as the other individuals. Um, but you can also, uh, you know, we should also think about differences across people, right? And so there shouldn't be a stringency that if my method doesn't show that gene A replicates in populations one and two, that it doesn't work. 
that seems to be dangerous because we, you know, there are differences amongst them and among us, and we should think about how to reconcile these two things as we as we evaluate and build methods out uh, uh, moving forward. Um, and so the 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 big thing I really want to uh, take away from here is the idea of you know complex data really do need complex methods, and and we need this from a few different aspects. You know, one, I've, I've, as since my time at Microsoft, I value this idea of interdisciplinary research. And I don't mean interdisciplinary research from the context of like a statistician needs to work with like a physicist. I mean, like a statistician should work with people in the social sciences, like bridging these gaps where people who have an idea of how to think about qualitative factors and how they affect our daily lives have concrete definitions of differences between race genetic uh, um, uh, ancestral lineage and, and populations, use these resources as a way to build and better inform better methodology so that we would push forward to think about how to, you know, create methods as, again, the push towards this idea of personalized medicine, um, that we're doing this in a thoughtful, ethical, like Brandon was mentioning, uh, conscious type of way. Um, and so I think about this as, as two ways of going about this. So there's, there's a camp that you know, we need to um, figure out a way to be more inclusive in the way that we include people in our studies. And so um, there's been a, there's a nice paper by Alicia Martin um, from the Broad Institute at MIT and Harvard, uh, Perspective Piece in Nature Genetics, where she shows that um, a, there's a huge uh, gap in, in, the, in the magnitude of individuals who are included in these studies. And they're all come from typically of, of one ancestry. And so uh, she has a really nice figure where people of, of uh, European ancestry are, are on, the, on the order of hundreds and hundreds of thousands of people that have been sequenced. And the next set of individuals are on the order of tens of thousands. Well, you can think about how that might bias our opinion of how we think genetic architecture uh, um, is for across many different traits, right? Um, there's not enough representation. And so there is this call in the field to think about how we include more individuals in our studies. Um, and, and there's an ethical question there, I think, which Brandon was kind of touching on, which is, you know, how do you think about the communities as you go into them to get more people? In number of people reaching infinity is nice, um, especially from a computer science perspective. We would like to see every possibility out there. Um, but we need to do that and move in a way that is ethical for these communities that we're moving into. And really think about the, the specific health disparities that might be uh, prevalent in certain populations, certain groups, and really think about how to do right by those individuals. And so that brings me to my, my next point, um, which is, uh, you know, what if you can't? So there's this idea here that, you know, what if we just need uh, better methods just to deal with the data that we have? So for certain groups, for certain indigenous groups, it may not be such that we're going to be able to sequence everyone. And for a lot of populations, N is never going to get to infinity. And so I also want to make a, a call here or, or, or push for people to think about, you know, data for uh, uh, methods for small n, right? Like, how do we use the data that we've seen? How do we um, um, improve the methods that we have? How do we pull outside resources from, from, from those who are um, in fields that we may not talk to? How do we cross those barriers? in order to, again, push towards this idea of, of personalized medicine. And again, I think statistics uh, data science, uh, uh, computer science, machine learning is, is a great tool uh, to be able to do this. But again, I don't think that we should work in silos. Thank you for those great comments. We've uh, heard from all of our panelists who brought illuminating and thought-provoking concepts here. And so now we'll turn to question and answer. Um, I would like to start by noticing how difficult it is for people to change the paradigm of how they classify people. The reality of classification is much more complex as you've talk, talked about, traits go beyond a gene or an environment uh, and include the environment, for example, or that uh, genome is really a historical context with global processes. Also talking about DNA doesn't explain the human experience and how that all connects. But humans are oftentimes very reductionist, aren't we? And we like to classify people based on immediate traits or appearance. And in Canada, where I'm from, they talk about visible minorities. So the color you are 
dictates how people see you or interpret your gen genetic information. So help me understand, panelists, what can we do here? How do we change this paradigm? Yeah, I mean, I think we're all struggling with how to enter this important question. It's true. I mean, I guess my maybe going back to something that I said and, and well, that all of us touched on is that um, uh, I think, right, this the, we do for some reason, our brains kind of like to bin things, right? That's something that we learn from a young age about the way we approach the world. There are different types of animals, there are different types of colors. And, you know, and then we spend most of our adult life, I think, trying to break down, you know, like we're not experiencing one emotion at any time or one thought at any time. Um, I think what, going back to this idea of, of traits um, and medical outcomes as predicting medical outcomes as being one of the, you know, potentials that geneticists and others would love to see genetics help achieve is that in fact, I mean, Dr. Denry, you know better than the rest of us that like, if, if I were to give you my genome as A's, C's, T's and G's and ask you, tell me some things about myself, even with the best software and the best methods, there's probably not very much you could tell me. But if I were to tell you other things about my life, like the fact that, um, I walk to work, I have children, I have friends that I see on a regular basis when we're not in a pandemic, you could probably predict a lot about my life, right? Or if I told you about what I do for a living or um, where I get my groceries. And so there are um, useful pieces of information that can help us think about some of these life traits that we wanna learn more about and use to help help people have a good quality of life. But I guess what, what I struggle with is the fact that, um, as Brandon said, so, so well, people really want the genome to be one of those things that helps us make those predictions. And I, I just think what all of us are trying to say is like, what if we dismantle that idea and instead say, you know, in fact, just on its own, the genome isn't gonna help us understand a lot of these things. That that we want to answer, want want to understand, and maybe I'll let I'll let Brandon and and Lauren riff from that. I uh, my, my immediate thoughts to that is um, it's a multifaceted problem, right? Um, I think it was was he was trying to mention, and, and I think the the challenge here also is there's a huge qualitative portion to this that is hard to quantify, but a lot of people want us to quantify it in some way. Um, and, and, and really we rely on quantitative methods as a way to, to make some of these inferences. Mm -hmm. um, and I think that's a part that, that I, you know, like really struggle with, right? For, so for instance, thinking about how to uh, uh, quantify things like pain tolerance and these kind of things where you're thinking about um, different disparities and for medical outcomes, for instance, right? And how to better treat uh, certain individuals. Um, that has a huge social factor, I think, that people have shown. Um, uh, there's a huge social influence on some of these kind of qualitative measures, but thinking about how to, how to uh, uh, you know, express them in a way um, where you also at the same time don't create more bias is, is I think, a difficult uh, challenge there. I don't know, Brandon, you yeah, yeah, no, I mean, I think this this problem is fundamental. I think, um, I think Natalie, Natalie Angier says we were incorrigible categorizers. We love to put ourselves in boxes. It's what human beings do. I think the question is, what are those boxes, right? And I think, I think it can be very human to organize ourselves, but we do not have to organize ourselves in a manner that is destructive, that justifies bad things that have happened through history or treating each other differently, okay? So look at me and Lauren Crawford, right? We're both African-American men, right? He has the unfortunate stance of being a Lakers fan. That's another kind of box that he's in. We can actually decide, we can define ourselves a lot of different ways. He's also a Californian, right? So he's really, really foreign to me. So my point is there's many dimensions through which we differ that we can choose to organize ourselves as a species. We don't have to do it on the ones that we're doing it. And, right, and, and I think, so when it comes to considering the role of history and all that, I mean, Part of it is we're just lazy and we want a shortcut to be able to explain things quickly. And if I can spit out a piece of information into a computer and it tells me everything and why this group was enslaved and why this group was invaded and why we're treating women this way, well, then I can go to sleep at night better. Unfortunately, that's just not the way it works. 
That's not how biology works. You're going to have to read some history. You're going to have to read some, right, some sociology. You're going to have to watch the news and read the news. And you're going to have to learn, right, the super math that Professor Crawford and Ramachandran do. These, th that's just, those are the breaks. And I'm sorry for people who want to understand the world and want it to be easier, but that's just the way it is. Well, and maybe I'll add one more thing to that, um, which is this touches on another question that showed up in the chat. That a lot of the way that we're taught genetics in primary school is completely false and over discretizes and simplifies the way that traits, like the genetic architecture of traits. For example, the way that we learn about in a Punnett square, brown eyes and blue eyes being governed by one allele. I mean, this is like totally problematic and not actually how pigmentation of any of our body, especially our eyes is governed. And so people, and again, you know, there's a, there was a question about curriculum and genetics. I mean, again, Dr. Denry would know a lot about the extent to which genetics is taught in medical school, which is shifting, but you know, historically it was not necessarily a huge unit for medical education, but even, um, I am also a Californian, <laughs> like Lauren Crawford, and even in, um, even in California growing up, but when I was in grad school, I had friends who had grown up in, um, you know, Kentucky and North Carolina who did not learn anything about evolutionary biology growing up. In my school, it was the last unit that we did in high school biology, in AP biology, in fact, in advanced placement biology. It was not the organizing principle by which we were taught about the life sciences. We were taught first that the mitochondrion is the powerhouse of the cell, and then we were taught about photosynthesis. And so, you know, all of these things, I think, combined to create this problem of an oversimplification of, you know, traits are simple in their genetic architecture, we can predict them, we know how um, they're encoded, and that there are differences amongst people, all of these things are intersecting at a young age in our minds. And of course, we're going to carry that into adulthood. And so definitely primary education has to ex be expanded by scientists like the panelists here um, to, to help um, to help change the rhetoric that we use when we talk to children and talk as children about these things, just like we're trying to do with gender roles and with race um, and social experiences with kids nowadays. So this raises, uh, so a lot of the questions in the uh, Q&A are focused on how do we change the conversation? How do we educate differently? What terms could we use differently to help us really grasp the question and really answer the question the best way we can. So the you touched upon, um, uh, Sohini, you to touched upon education. And also, you know, I think we have to educate the scientists who are asking those same questions around genetic classifications, for example. And so even recently, an article talked about the, how do we need to diversify polygenic risk scores? And that's something you mentioned, Lauren. However, does that put us back in that pigeonhole of race and defining people by very, very limited uh, characteristics? So how do we get out of this, this hole, so to speak? Uh, how do we change the paradigm? Yeah, that's a good and, and very tough question. I think, I know Sonny and I talk about this like in our uh, weekly meetings like all the time of how to push this question forward. You know, one thing I've, I've, I've broached with um, some colleagues at, at Microsoft Research is this idea that the, the binning that we like to do is dynamic and it's fluid. And if we can figure out in what, for what situations certain bins make sense and for what situations certain bins do not make sense and kind of having a roadmap or start chipping away at what that roadmap might like, look like, that might help think about how to, um, uh, uh, you know, mitigate some of these issues. Um, this, this is a tough, this is a really tough problem. So, so in polygenic risk scores, I mean, there's a, there's, a, there's a myriad of reasons why these things don't replicate across different groups. Um, um, some of them being that the methods that we use are too simple. I mean, that, that's probably my own right on, on these things. Um, some of these things uh, being that there's a lack of uh, diversity in which we're training on. And so that goes back to the two camps I was talking about, this idea of improving methods and, and, and improving uh, uh, our inclusion in our, in our studies. Um, yeah, but I, I, I think what, what ends up happening is that some of these bins just don't make sense for certain traits. And so there's like, there's not a, there's not a, a, a you know, a ancestral lineage sometimes doesn't make sense for things where you're thinking about how to predict 
things like height and these other things, or, or our Brandon, our Brandon Myers favorite is educational attainment. <laughs> like um, thinking about those, uh, and I know he's laughing a lot because that, that's one that we're like, I don't really understand how you're, that, why we're bending people in this way to predict these things. It's, it's uh, um, uh, so that's one I have a, a really big problem with. Um, but I think thinking about where those kind of things make a lot of sense when they don't, contextually speaking, um, and starting basically from ground zero and how we uh, um, define these groups is is going to be a, a you know I think a huge step forward. Yes, um, in terms of the way uh, people perceive the groups and uh, make so many inferences in medicine, there's a whole field of. Uh, racialization of medicine, so to speak, where, you know, someone asked a question about, uh, for example, the glomerular filtration rate that's been pegged as being different between racial groups at black versus white. And uh, we often hear about uh, whether some certain therapies work for blood pressure management in blacks versus white. I, I struggle with that, knowing that uh, we're so admixed. How do we narrow it down to something like this. Um, maybe the mm -hmm. geneticists mm -hmm. <laughs> can help us understand why these theories have evolved and why are we still talking about things like this? Well, I guess, I mean, I don't have a great answer, <laughs> unfortunately, although, um, uh, but I'll, I'll add another turn of the screw to the problem, which is, um, you know, going back to what, what Lauren was talking about in terms of the role of statistics here, you know, we've been talking a lot about, and, and we're right to talk a lot about the, um, the independent variables that are going into say what we want to study here. So, you know, the individual genomes, covariates like sex, um, and, and also the way we want to, you know, the way we as individuals get categorized or categorize each other or both. Um, but also, uh, medical traits are a category, right? And there's a spectrum there of responses that we we might, there might be certain traits um, where, you know, the average trait value for individuals in a particular geographic region or with a particular ancestry composition are different, but the range within that group could overlap easily with any other group. And sometimes I think, I think, these issues of discretization, which is why I'm saying I'm not providing a solution, just another question. Um, they also apply to the way we talk about traits. So, you know, heart disease is not one disease, it's a suite of diseases. And um, some of what Lauren and Brandon and I talk about, in our, and Lauren and I, especially in our collaborations, is how do we actually take the same approaches people are using to try to understand genetic differences between um, groups of people and instead shift that to the dependent variable to the phenotype and say, can we actually identify genetic etiologies or gene by environment interactions that are differing in the phenotype and understand that maybe early stage, the genetic architecture of early onset heart disease could be quite different from late onset, right? Um, so that's like another category that it would be great for us to additionally focus on more than we are with these um, categories of individual genomes. Briefly, what I, what I would add um, to that, uh, both stellar comments as always, and thank you for them, uh, Professors Ramachandran and Crawford. Um, I mean, in terms of practicality, what would I say? What would be the three things I would say we can get better at that would enable us to kind of wrap our head around this problem better? Uh, one is uh, this better teaching, like Professor Ramachandran mentioned, the notion that the way genetics is taught, right? Genetics, the way Professor Emilia Huerta Sanchez has said to me once, it's just a piece of information. It's important information, but it, it's just one dimension. Like you don't actually have to teach that this is the whole pie. You just you can teach for fundamentally that it's part of the, it's part of it, right? Um, you know, I think there's this. You know, I, I remember I was talking to a friend who has uh, who who has an increased risk, really really high risk of type two diabetes or something like that and has no type 2 diabetes in his family, like genetically, has no type 2 diabetes in his family, and is like a super vegan or something like that, or one of these people who eat ultra healthy. So what I'm saying is, in, almost independent of what's in the, 
the genetic information might be useful for predicting type 2 diabetes in a certain context, in a certain population measured at a certain time, but it might be completely meaningful, meaningless for this individual in this context, in this time. And so my point is, I think that's at the educational level. I think related to that, and I know Professor Crawford in particular is going to shout, so please try not to, but I think stati- our, our, the public's statistical reasoning as a whole is just bad. We don't think about probabilities and risk it very, very well. And I deal with this in the context of my other life, studying infectious disease. I deal with this in my COVID vaccine wars, right? My life kind of describing kind of what does 96% efficacy really mean? It's just hard for people to land on what these percentages actually mean and animate that in their regular life. And then three, and this is very, very practical for educators. I'm a big believer in a liberal arts education, right? For this reason, I think, I, I think scientists should, like, should have to take the histories and the sociologies and the politics the way that Professor Crawford mentioned early, just because again, genetics is just a piece and an important and awesome and an amazing piece of information, but it is only a piece of information. And I think a more comprehensive understanding uh, may in the next generation get us through some of these problems. Thank you all. So one uh, other piece that comes up is as we try to diversify the genetic data, it's important to understand that people also have concerns. How is that data going to be utilized? How are we making sure that the data is utilized correctly so that there are no excessive inferences about what that means or how that classifies people or discriminates against people? Any thoughts from any of you? It all boils down to education. We keep coming back to that, but um, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I think it's incredibly, incredibly important for geneticists to um, read about, educate ourselves about, and um, recognize the history of our field of biological anthropology of, and, you know, some of the research that's still happening now and the way that, um, way that data and information is being commodified in some ways from, in many ways, from communities that are then underserved structurally by our societies, including the medical enterprise and scientific education. I I will say that I really, um, really appreciated the recent uh, teaching that was done by undergraduates at Brown on decolonizing STEM curriculum and sort of noting that as scientists, um, you know, STEM disciplines at Brown should not hide behind the idea that science is objective. It's not, it's colored by who does it, what we do and, and our data come from places. And I would really like to see um, and to learn in my field about how to have those conversations. We talk about this a lot in my lab too, about again, going back to where I started, um, uh, you know, when I was presenting that nomenclature in genetic studies is really problematic. And it's very easy to just use these names for groups of samples that the first paper of the thousand genomes used and, you know, to kind of, uh, keep blinders on about what that means. Like, what does it mean that the South Asian sample that we study in the thousand genomes is Gujarati individuals who live in Houston, Texas? And how do we extrapolate from that to almost billion people who live in South Asia (laughs) in in just India, right? Versus like, if you think about South Asia more broadly, a lot more people. Um, So that's, you know, I think there are I think it's really important also for scientists to push both scientific journals and funding bodies to start recognizing the importance of working with and both in educational capacities and in the dissemination of results, working with communities that have been um, persecuted or exploited in the past by biological research and trying to develop that trust and to also recognize that that trust might not exist for a long time. And, and I think we really need to do this right and be willing to work over the long haul to build those relationships and try to help people get more access to information that's gonna improve their lives. Yeah, to the, uh, to, the, to the issue of kind of the diversifying clinical trials uh, conversation, I think is what you brought, you brought that up, Dr. Dennery, and like the, the, this apparent contradiction between needing a more diverse pool of individuals who are we're sequencing right and 
um, and the notion that you're kind of crystallizing and hardening race in that situation. I mean, the way I think about it is this. I mean, um, I think the, the reason we need more people right, involved in these tests is not necessarily because individuals who self-identify as Black are essentially or biologically different, but also because you're getting those people's experiences. <laughs> you're getting a breadth of experiences. You're getting a breadth of kind of life trajectories. You're getting a breadth of generational trajectories. You're getting a breadth of where people live. You're getting all of that information when you include people in these studies. And that's all important information if you actually want to understand the way the phenotypes are working. Now, what's happening, and this is the way the data are bearing out, is when we do GWAS across these things, the signals are muddy and they don't really translate. And that should be telling us <laughs> not that genetics is bad or wrong, but that's not the whole story. There's something else going on there. And frankly, I mean, it, it, no hyperbole, right? Professors Ramachandran and Crawford, two of the best in the world, flat out at this exact problem of disentangling this exact problem. So, uh, so my point is, I, I think that's how I think about that apparent contradiction, uh, because it doesn't, doesn't harden race because you're not, you're basically just sampling across human experiences. So, I, I just want to add one, one last thought to that, which is I think that's, that kind of stresses that there's an importance that there is the science behind the data collection part as well to this. Um, and that we, sh we need to include the communities that we're collecting from for a myriad of reasons. Um, uh, one, because of everything that Brandon just mentioned, this idea of, of the science and, and, and uh, this, this idea of diversifying, not just like uh, the, the, the genetic portion of this, but the, the, the total picture of this. Um, but also from the aspect of like, what is this that this community actually needs, right? The way that you build trust with communities is if you're attending to problems that are actually uh, connected to these communities um, and not just thinking about uh, genetic diversity as a whole, but thinking about the specific people that this data is coming from. I think that's a huge part that's missing. These are all uh, terrific points and uh, I'm sure we could continue forever, but I would want to ask a small question, hopefully small answer, which is not going to happen, but uh, the uh, because it's too complicated. The, the There's a trend, of course, with all this genetic testing at the commercial level with the 23andMe. And in some instances, it's been used in science to, to utilize these data sets to inform certain things. But it doesn't it put us more into this categorization around race? And what is what is race? Is race something that was invented to break us apart rather than continental origins, for example? Why, why are we utilizing so much of this genetic information? It's, is it fun? What, what are we doing? No. Anyone uh, have a good idea? Do you use any uh, of these data sets in your, uh, in your research? So Sahini probably should answer I this, have, right? <laughs> I have thoughts. Um, so, uh, okay, full disclosure, this makes me a very bad geneticist, but um, I have done, I mean, the fact that I have done 23andMe's um, ancestry test does not make me a bad geneticist, but the fact that I did it uh, a long time ago now, in probably 2005 or 2007, without thinking about the fact that I was putting the data of my hypothetical future offspring who are now not hypothetical <laughs> into a database um, uh, is sad to me now when I think about it. <laughs> um, I do think, you know, there are people for whom, uh, and they, you know, come from a variety of life experiences where genealogical research, understanding family origins, and again, ge genetics is just a, another piece of information there. Um, uh, is really, really interesting. But I think actually um, this is, I appreciate the, the um, plugs that Lauren made for data science earlier when we were talking. And I'll just say one of the reasons I feel very privileged to be interim director of Brown's data science initiative is that I think that in fact, um, genomic privacy is one of the most interesting data science problems um, and privacy and security problems of a large data set. Um, that we should be thinking about as a society. And, you know, in this country, we have very little protection over our um, genetic information. The Genetic Information Non-Discrimination Act could get dismantled if um, universal or if Obamacare is dismantled, which hopefully won't happen. I don't think people realize how little protection we have over 
um, genetic data in the US in particular. And I'd love to work with colleagues across campus, including um, Sunny Kamara, especially in CS and um, other folks in CS on databases and security. Because one of the things about genomic privacy um, that I don't think we talk a lot about is you can't change your genome. So for wh whatever it tells us, we can't alter it. Um, but you can change your credit score, right? You can get certain records expunged if you work hard enough at it. You can change other pieces of data that are out there in the universe about you. But once your genetic data, if it's ever put into a situation where it's not secure, which is not to say these companies don't keep the data secure, but um, for example, you just have to read articles about how the Golden State Killer was identified to learn about ways that people have downloaded and then re-uploaded to non-secure sites their genomic data. If one does that, usually for the noble purpose of trying to find relatives and, and kin that they don't know about, um, you're then really putting yourself um, an information that is incontrovertible and cannot be changed in a very, very insecure place. So I think this is a really important data science problem and we need to appreciate it as a data science problem. Think about how we wanna protect our, our information at the genetic level. Excellent point. Um, most people use it to figure out if, what their ancestry is, but also what their race is when it's really not giving you that information. Um, but, uh, we're coming upon uh, the, the, the end of the session. It's been absolutely fascinating, but I wanna give you all an opportunity to give your last thoughts and how, uh, you, you know, what are your last words for, for the audience? Um, I'll start with Lauren, since you're the first one that appears on my screen. Oh, okay, well, okay. Uh, see what I think about this. No, I, I, I want to stress that this is a very much a, a hard problem this is an open problem and it's not something that we're going to be able to work on and chip away at in silos. Um, I think as this idea of data science and the blurring between disciplines um, continues to happen, I think it's going to be on us as practitioners, us as methods developers, uh, uh, geneticists, social scientists, really work together uh, to really think about ways to solve all of these issues that, that we've been talking about that come up so prevalently. Um, again, I think, all, all the conceptual things that, that we've been talking about, I think methods is a really a unique space to kind of bridge these gaps. And I really want it to, to motivate um, the quantitative people, uh, quantitatively driven people on this call to really think about um, not only the, the, the social aspects that come into our models, but the interpretability and, and maybe the, the downstream effects that might come from those interpretations um, on these communities for which we're trying to make inferences. Um, and, and I think that's like a, that's a, that's a huge role and responsibility that we play as, as methods uh, uh, people. And so um, again, I think that this is gonna be a, a huge interdisciplinary effort. Um, and I hope that we as a community continue to make uh, important st steps forward. And I think this forum particularly is like the best first step to kind of do this. Thank you so much. Brandon, you're next on my screen. Great. Um, no, thank you. Thank you for this. Very, very exciting. I, I think I'll draw a quick analogy back to kind of, again, my other life in thinking about kind of infectious diseases and mathematical models of epidemics. And when I'm describing kind of vaccine skepticism to people, and what I tell them is this, I say, uh, there's nothing I can tell you that's going to make you confident in vaccines. My job is to provide enough evidence that if you want to be a skeptic, your kind of skepticism has to get more and more magical, right? Meaning you have to come up with crazier and crazier ways to deny it. That's my job. It's to kind of make it hard for you to be a skeptic. You don't want to take it. You don't have to take it. And I think there's an analogy to be drawn there between this and scientific racism. There is, like, like Professor Crawford is as smart as they get. There is no paper that Professor Crawford can publish that will kind of erase racism. It's not going to happen, Okay. Insofar as you have people who do not like people and want to justify difference and justify society, you're always going to have people who look to science to, ju to justify racism and skepticism. It's always going to be here. Our job as scientists is to make them have to be more and more magical about the way that they get there. OK, meaning they could like the chugging milk thing that doesn't make any sense at all. Zero. So if you want to be an idiot and chug milk as a sign of your white supremacy, well, that's all like you can do that. You're free to do that. But that is so kind of bizarre and silly 
right? It, it's kind of like for the world to kind of see that. So I think the work that we need to do is to clarify the concepts enough, right? Such that all of these ideas kind of stand on such frail ground because they do. They're all fraught with really, really problematic reasoning. They're all fraught with broken reasoning. Like I said, it's all an attempt to get a shortcut about the way the world works. And our, our, our job is to get everyone to the point where if you wanna be a sexist, you just have to be a sexist. Don't ask genetics for help. If you wanna be a racist, be a racist, you cannot ask genetics for help. And that's what the, that's what the data are showing. And that's kind of where the field uh, can help uh, get us uh, when it comes to kind of addressing this big problem. Right. So he um, Yeah, so I would just add kind of riffing off of my colleagues uh, two, two more things. One is I totally agree these are hard and open problems. I also think that they are the most exciting problems. <laughs> and, you know, I would love to see, again, going back to what data science is emerging to be and what it can be, I think, at Brown because of how connected our campus is across disciplines. Um, I think the idea behind data science is learning things from data that you wouldn't have learned otherwise. You wouldn't have learned from a hypothesis driven framework or based on things you already knew. So it's about dismantling deep-seated beliefs that you might approach the data with. And, and I think that from, you know, all the things we talked about today, from the way we could be educating children differently about how traits are encoded to um, not giving oxygen to, um, you know, agendas that are, are at their heart trying to create inequities in society, whether it's among races, whether it's among sexes or genders, um, that these are all things that I think um, genetics, you know, I would love to see genetics as the paradigm in, or a paradigm in data science education, because it really illustrates how the context in which data is generated should inform the methods with which they're analyzed and how important um, transferability of results, archiving results, reproducing results, and extrapolating from them is. And, you know, when you care about both giving people better health care, better access to health care, better health outcomes when you care about educating people properly. Um, and that's the, you know, the problem that you're trying to work on. I think that's when really exciting social change can happen. And that's when you can also approach people who have thoughts about, say, you know, educational systems and tell them the data shows, in fact, that your educational outcomes are going to be predicted by whether your parents were able to read to you at night versus, you know, your, what you look like or whether you're a girl or a boy or something like this. So um, I really think that, you know, for all those um, young people who might or might not be watching this, um, who are interested in becoming a data scientist, I would urge them to consider going into genetics because I think that it is an area that is just rife with opportunity um, to have a huge impact on the way that we do things. Um, in our society. Thank you so much for all of these very important comments. And uh, it is a, a challenging problem that we'll continue to work on uh, in, in understanding how to better educate people, how to socialize this across many spectrums and, and many areas. Um, it, it, it's really um, uh, disheartening to think that we are looking for ways to justify bad behavior or bad approaches to education, to medicine, to many things by uh, basing, basing it on a genetic construct. So more conversations like this will be terrific. Um, with that, um, we're coming upon the time to say goodbye to all of us and to, to conclude that uh, this has been a tremendous session. I really appreciate everyone's comments. And this event has been made possible uh, by uh, Tricia Rose and her colleagues, colleagues at CSRA, CSREA sorry, and the Provost's Office. And uh, this series has been just amazing and thought-provoking. And so also we'd like to thank media services and university events for their skilled support and uh, the exceptional panel of scientists that we've had today, Drs. Crawford, Ogbonu, and Ramachandran. And of course, it's really wanna thank the audience for their excellent questions. We couldn't get to all of them, uh, but I think the panelists have been 
screening the the q and a to and and it, this is clearly came came up in some of the comments that were made. Please tune in for next month's session uh, race and anti black racism that's scheduled for april twenty first at noon. So thank you all for your participation and looking forward to seeing you in the next uh, go round. Thank you.